Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Southside Bible Church. Welcome to the family. Good to see everybody here for worship. And if you're visiting, we're glad you're here with us as well. And we pray you will be encouraged now uh, in the Word of God as we, we believe we continue worshiping through the proclaimed Word of God. And so I pray that our time of worship now would be beautiful in the Word. So if you'll open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17 this morning. Just a great passage that we're going to look at. This portion of Scripture could be maybe where this whole epistle has been leading to. Peter has laid the foundation for its exhortation really from the beginning. So if I had to summarize this quickly over Peter, as he begins telling you that you're a chosen race, you're rejected by the world right now, but you've been chosen by God You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. You're now an alien. You've been set apart to holy living in the midst of an unholy world. And the purpose being is that you might proclaim the excellencies then of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We are called aliens and strangers in 1 Peter 2.11. We're called to abstain then from fleshly lusts which wage war against our souls. Then there's a clarion call that Peter gives to be in the world, but not of it. A call to evangelize our society and our world why we don't belong to the system and its structures and its morals and its values. It is thus a very threatening world that we are to go reach with the gospel. And our living, Peter says, is to be the instrument to proclaim the truth to this cosmos so that they might be saved. Our lives are to be the instrument. And so this whole section of Peter's epistle that we are now looking at started in chapter 2, verse 11, all the way through chapter 3 here, is how are we to live in the world with an evangelistic purpose in mind as we engage it? And I just wonder how many of us are living this way where we, we, we have this heart and we have this focus that Peter is addressing. It's so much easier to just hang out with believers and talk about what we agree on and encourage each other in it. That's a beautiful part, but, but you'd rarely get persecuted doing that, and you can get very comfortable in just settling into that instead of realizing, I've been born again to go shine this light into this world. So as we begin This morning, I just wanted to give you maybe a bird's eye view again and ask you, are you getting this? Is it wedging you out from your comfort of not uh, intentionally engaging a persecuting world with the only message that can save their souls from eternal hell where you were headed if it was not for the grace of God in your life? Have you gotten over that? I've been spared. I've been delivered. I now am a debtor to all men. To go tell them of this grace of God that has come and invaded my life. I pray that we would have God's heart for this world. And so I wanted to begin this morning by praying because we can only be these kind of people by God's grace. No manipulation or guilt feelings will ever produce this. Only the grace of God overwhelming our hearts to say, I want to go shine this marvelous light into this world. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and I pray that there would be many in this gathered assembly this morning who are shining the light of what you have done in their lives. I pray that they're living the way we've been learning in this epistle, and I pray that they're getting looks, and people are asking them, what is the hope within them? God, I pray that you would wedge us out from our comforts. I pray that we would not just be happy to merrily go to heaven and ignore those who do not have the hope of this gospel. God, awaken us to that need. Help us to not just be about our own comforts and our own self and our own eternity. God, awaken us, please, to the need of this world, those we dwell with on a daily basis who need the gospel of Jesus Christ, and help us to not contradict this message by our lives. God, I pray that we would live lives worthy of the calling that we have received in Christ Jesus. Lord, uh, move by the power of your grace in every heart to be these kind of men, women, and children. We ask that you do that in every one of these hearts. And it's in Christ's name that we approach and we pray and we ask these things. Amen. Well, our outline, Peter's going to give us two necessary helps then 
and enduring the assaults then of a hostile world. And we're going to look in verse 13 and see there's a passion that we're to have in persecution. And then in verses 14 through 17, he kind of gives us a prescription uh, in persecution. What, what will help us to endure it? How should we do it? How should we be ready? And uh, he will address that in those verses. So let's take up the first point, a passion and persecution. I want to read verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? This is really a logic question. Who is there to harm you if you are proving zealous for what is good? And for, for the most part, but not always, the world loves to persecute those who are hypocrites. It's really a dainty morsel to them. They, they love it. It shows that maybe I'm okay after all because you're a fake. You're, you're no better than me. In fact, you're worse, so I'm okay Self-righteousness can go forward now. Everything feels better. Hypocrisy makes it easier on them in their rejection of Jesus Christ. And so hypocrites are going to get persecuted by this world when you are a professing Christian. When you profess Christ and fall, the world will jump on that fast. It will come and devour it and just gobble you up, snarl while it tries to take away that profession. But it is rare that they pounce on the one who's truly living out righteousness. And I mean the one who is living quietly and submissive to the government and to their bosses and to their spouses and all that we've been learning and that they're loving the way Peter is calling. Uh, Jesus was that, and yes, you still will be persecuted, but what I am seeing in this text, he's saying if you get persecuted for being a hypocrite, that's on you. And, and someone who lives this Christ-like life, he's telling you it's going to bring some persecution, but it's also going to bring people who are going to get saved, and they're going to ask you what is the hope within you, and they're going to glorify God on the day of their visitation because of your excellent behavior. So there's going to be two kinds of responses, but the hypocrite is just going to get buried and pummeled. So let's take a look at verse 13. If you prove zealous for what is good. That's an interesting word. It's a title of when Peter wrote this of a people in that region uh, who were called the zealots. The zealots, they were fanatical patriots wanting to liberate, liberate Israel from all foreign rule, Roman rule. And they were willing to do it at the cost of their lives. They would murder, they would cheat, they would lie, whatever it took. They were extremely zealous for their cause and that's why they got the name zealots. Peter chooses that word. Peter was very much a zealot in his own personality as well. He was so zealous for the Lord early on, quick to step out, quick to jump up for the Lord, and and he still is even as he writes this message. So one who is zealous for Christ, who lives this out with his whole being and all of his passions, all of his life. You're not playing at this. This is, this has taken over my heart and my life. And there are many in the world who appreciate that. They just love when someone is zealous for something. The phonies and the hypocrites, you're going to be in for it. That could be why many of us won't open up our mouths at work or school because a riot would break out if you told someone you were a believer. And so we need to live lives that show the zealousness that we have for our God. So when we speak of these things, they say, yes, I've watched your zeal for the truth of God. Be zealous, Peter says, for what is good. And so our context is, if you'll go back to verse 8, to sum up, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. So be those kind of people who are sympathetic and brotherly and giving yourselves to each other, not reviling in verse 9 when you get reviled, not slandering but living in glad submission to the authorities that God has placed over you. Be zealous for the things that we've been learning in Peter. Go hard after this spirit and life before a watching world. They're watching. And as you will be zealous and prove zealous for this, Peter's saying, I want you to be zealous for what is good then. Go after being a, a one who does good to men. And mankind, be one, a do-gooder is the call. Be zealous to go live these excellent lives of modeling Christ to this world. That is to be the passion of the believer. 
In verses 14 through 17, then, I I need some help. The prescription that he gives us now in persecution. And the question is, how how do we endure the persecution of this world? When we want uh, good days and the good life that we looked at last week, I, I want the good life, and being persecuted doesn't feel like the good life. How do we endure this? How, how, how are they going to get saved by me living this way? What kind of a life is going to cause someone to literally ask me, what is the hope within you? What kind of life is going to bring someone to ask that? And so let's try and maybe get our arms then around this current section. And as I look at the verses before us, let me just read them to you starting in verse 14. <clears throat> but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame." For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. And as I look at this, I see two really glaring things that Peter is after. And I think they hold the whole section together. And so once you understand those two foundation points, the other four just kind of hang on them. So I'm going to spend most of the morning on these two points, and the other four will just kind of wrap up in summary at the end of this morning's message. So let's start looking at the two foundation stones of Peter's point, namely, how do you endure persecution in such a way that people will glorify God when they get saved because of the way you're living your life? So look with me in verse 15. The first thing I want you to see is to sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. This is a call to hallow. Hallowed be thy name in the Lord's prayer. It means to sanctify to to sanctify Jesus as Lord in our hearts. So what is it to sanctify? Well, it means to be holy. It means to be set apart. It means to be hallowed. And so if something was set apart in the Old Testament, it was set apart for a sacred use. Everything that was used in the temple was called holy because it was used only for that part in the worship of Israel. And so it's set apart. It has a special place. It's consecrated. It's holy. And so we are to set Christ apart in our hearts. It's a call to regard Jesus as the holiest of all beings. It's to put him above everything. He's he's above all. He's off the charts. He's infinite in all of his attributes. He's separate. He's holy. And it's, it's to put Jesus then in your heart in the absolute highest place. There should be nothing in your heart that goes higher than Christ. So if you want to get this persecution, you got to begin with Christ has to have the holy place in your heart. He has to have the place that nothing in your life is higher, more of a desire, more that you're after than Jesus Christ. He must have that place. He must be the most esteemed person in your life. He must be the most loved of all in your heart. He's the most treasured. He's the supreme one. That's what he's calling for. The place that he is to be sanctified is where? He's to be sanctified in your hearts, in the very uh, mission control center, the very center of all of your being. He's to be sanctified as Lord. He's to be set in your heart. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, King Jesus. He's the one that we bow before. And he has our full and our total allegiance. You are Lord. I have set you apart. I bow to you. I follow you. I serve you. I believe you. I worship you. You have been set apart, Jesus Christ, consecrated in my heart as holy. You're the sovereign ruler of the universe, and I have that consecrated in my heart. Does Jesus Christ have that place in your heart? All of Christianity starts with this as its starting point. Jesus is Lord. He has been risen and he's seated at the right hand of God and everything bows to him. This religion begins, we bow to Jesus Christ. He's Lord. I've sanctified that one in my heart to be in that place. He he alone has that place. 
in my heart. And without that, there's no persecution. Because you'll do anything to escape it for what we call the good life. You will escape persecution at any cost because Jesus Christ doesn't consecrate as Lord. If it gets too hot in the kitchen, I will change my commitments. I will change my convictions. I will turn if, if it gets too much. And so if you're ever going to suffer persecution rightly, it's that Jesus Christ has been set apart as Lord of my life, and I will not turn away from what he's asked me to say, do, and be in this world. I will not turn away from Christ. I will be persecuted for the one who has been put in that place in my heart. If not, you'll think the devil is on the throne by persecution and you'll flee it. You'll not care supremely that Jesus is obeyed and preached at any cost. That will get away from you. If Jesus is just another aspect of your life, if Jesus is just an add-on, if he's just someone that you pray to when you're in trouble, someone that you need on your deathbed, you will lay this aside when the cost becomes too great for his name. He must be set apart in your heart as Lord. And that's settled. It's done. I'll never turn away from the one who died on a tree for me. This is the foundation stone that this whole section must be built on. It's almost a, like a cornerstone. I would call it the cornerstone once again. Everything has to be built on this Christ. And here's the cornerstone then in persecution. If I'm ever going to endure persecution, some of you might be sitting here going, I always shut my mouth. I never speak up. I won't do it. I'm not living this way. And here it is. This is the cornerstone. If you're going to do this rightly, Jesus Christ has to be sanctified as Lord in your heart for any persecution that will come against that name. I'll endure it. Sanctify him as Lord in your hearts. Well, what does verse 14 tell us? Even if you should suffer then for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. They're going to come against you. And as you sanctify Christ in your heart as Lord, you don't need to fear. You don't need to be troubled as they come at you. There's a way to drive out the fear of your heart, of this world, and the heat, and what it brings against you. There's a way to drive it out. Perfect love drives out all fear. Set Christ in that place, and it will drive out. He's saying, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to worry. You've got the King of Kings on your side. And as the world is coming hard against you, and they're calling you a fool, Christ is hallowed in my heart. Which I think ties into verse 17, for it's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. If God wills it so, if this one who is Lord of Lords decrees that I'm going to suffer, that I'm going to be persecuted, that someone at work is going to come against me, it's from his hand. And Jesus is my Lord, and he just so happens to be Lord of all. And even those who are coming after you are from him. He's Lord over them. He is Lord over their slander. He is Lord over all the reviling that they will bring. He is Lord over your response to them. He is Lord to empower you to respond in the way that we've been learning in this letter in quiet submission and gentleness and humility. God is able to give you that response in the midst of all this persecution. He's the cornerstone for suffering. There's no other way to do this but him being set apart as Lord in my heart. And I, I'll suffer anything. Because he has that place. I'll speak up and I'll be called a fool and I'll be rejected at work and in my own family, uh, my own husband, my own wife. I, I'm going to stand for Jesus Christ at any cost. He's Lord. Secondly, the next part of our foundation is if you'll keep reading in verse 15. <clears throat> First foundation stone, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Here's the second one. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Be ready to make a defense for the hope that's within you. And I want you to notice that this is to sanctify Christ as Lord. To sanctify Him as Lord is to have a hope in Him. He's resurrected. He's the risen one. My hope is in Him. 
And so how does that work? Well, the answer is Christ is your hope. Do you remember back in 1 Peter 1, 3, he's the grounds for your hope. You've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reason you have hope is in Christ. He's the grounds for your hope. He died, paid the penalty, he's been risen, he's your victory. The grounds for your hope is Jesus Christ. And then in 1.13, the goal of your hope is Jesus Christ. Fix your hope on the coming to you grace of God that's to be revealed in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so now he's, he's the grounds of why I can hope, and he's the goal of my hope. My hope is looking for that day that Jesus Christ comes back to make all things new. And so there is it. Christ is our hope. Christ is trustworthy. He is an absolute stable hope. He is, he is set apart and your heart as Lord. He has that spot. And so when I'm asked, what is the hope within you? I don't have to go looking. <laughs> He's sanctified in my heart. I've got an answer. He's why I live the way that I do. His resurrection, he's Lord of all. He, he has victory. He is the reason I hope. You ask me what my hope is, it's locked, it's centered. I don't even have to think about it. It's the risen one. The two are inseparably linked. He is my Lord and my heart sanctified, and therefore he is my hope. His lordship, his resurrected Savior, is the only thing that can explain my life. My life now is a life filled with hope in Jesus Christ, and that's the only thing that explains me. Nothing else works. Nothing else can really articulate and help people understand me. So what is the hope within you? Jesus Christ. And when I live and respond this way in a hostile world, fearless in verse 14, I'm not troubled, willing to not be in the inner circle, willing to be persecuted and mocked and reviled, to show the world that Christ is the Lord of my life, to show the world that he has filled me with hope. They're going to see it. They will see a man or woman or child who lives this way, and someone's going to ask you, what is your hope? And they might not use those words, but that's what they're asking. What is the hope? Well, then you do see what, what a life that must be for someone to ask that? Do you see how these two things hold this whole text and this whole letter and maybe the whole Bible together? Don't miss this. The main point of the Bible, all of its history, is a God who has a desire and a goal to be hallowed in this universe and to be put on display and worshipped and glorified. That is, that is to, to set him apart. And, and he does that by setting Christ apart in our hearts. And then secondly, the means he does it is by us hoping in him. The way he's glorified is us hoping in this God. That's the glory of Christianity, not us hoping in ourselves like every cult. We hope only in the cornerstone. We hope only in Him, and that is what Peter is teaching us. It's that this uh, kind of a hope is going to have a very peculiar life attached to it. If you have this hope that you've been born again to and that you have fixed your mind waiting for, he's saying you're going to have a different kind of life. You can't live like a world who believes you've got to get it all now. Grab the gusto now or you won't get anything. You've got to look different. You have to be set apart. And there has to be people who are going to be watching saying, what, what's the difference? What's the hope? Do you realize the life that we're being called to live in Peter? It's because Christ is sanctified as Lord in my heart, which is seen by my hope being worked out in a different way. And as the world watches, they're going to scratch their heads and go, huh, I look at everyone else at work, I look at everyone else in this classroom, and I'm watching everyone else in my house, and they just don't seem to be like you. There's something different. What is it? They're they're not bound by Fridays. These crazy Christians come in here on Mondays, and they're just as happy as they are on Fridays. T-G-I-M. Thank God it's Monday. And they don't seem stressed about money and having enough to pay their bills. They just don't seem like they're chicken with their head cut off. They're trusting. They don't worry. And they're not trying to accumulate enough so I can finally be secure because my security is in my hope. There's something different. They don't seem to have to be accepted by everyone. 
I'm already in the inner, inner circle. I'm already accepted. And they just don't seem to be craving the inner circle like everyone else. They don't smooth up to the boss, but they work harder than anyone else. They're happy when other people get promoted ahead of them. They endure ill treatment. They don't laugh at the dirty jokes. They don't find their identity in their children, but they love them so deeply. And as I watch these people, what makes them tick? There's something that they're hoping in that I'm not, nor anyone else around here except that born-again lady in the second office on the third floor. They're all the same. There's something different about believers. And so now the day has come that we pray for every day. And they come up to you and they say, what's the hope within you? There's something different. What's the hope within you? And I have been living like this for a decade. And I've been praying for this. And there, it's finally happened. Someone's finally asking, what do I say? What's the hope within you? Well, I kind of grew up in a Christian home, and my parents taught me since I was a child, and it just seems to make more sense than the other religions. Nothing else really has ever made more sense to me than Christianity. I've studied evolution, and I, I think it's just a bunch of people monkeying around. <laughs> I prayed about whether I should even use that. That was bad. <laughs> I feel like if I'm wrong... The world's going to be a better place anyways because of how I'm living. I pull out all my charts, and I show them evidence that demands a verdict, and, and finally all those classes I took are going to pay off. Or everyone has to make up their mind up about religion, and I've made mine up. Guys, if your life brings them to this question, number one, well done. But I'm afraid not many of us live in such a way that people even ask us this. And this, that's probably the best application is to go home and just say, has anyone ever asked me this my whole life? If no one's ever asked you this, something's wrong. And so this, this should be, man, we, we're different. We're aliens. We don't belong here. We usually just have to tell them because they won't ask. But now they ask, and what I'm telling you this morning is don't fumble the football what are you going to say? In your hearts right now, how would you answer that? Someone's asking you that right now. What's your answer? Thank you. <laughs> you need to be ready to make a defense. That's what this verse says. Be ready to tell them. And this should be so easy. For the one who has sanctified Christ as Lord in his heart, who has put all of your hope in him, that's why you're living different, is because of Christ. That's it. You've been daily coming to him as to a living stone and you're trusting him and you're being conformed to him. You're studying his word and you're growing and trusting him. The providences that have come into your life have shaped you and grown you to trust this God even deeper. And now you ask me, what is my hope? It should be as natural as breathing. It should not even have to be thought about because it's all I think about. I live in this daily. I, I can just tell you. I don't have to go say, give me two hours and I'll get back to you. Ask one of the stones in the temple, what's your hope? Cornerstone. Everything is built on the cornerstone. And so this is good for us maybe to just slow down this morning then and ask ourselves, why do I hope in the forgiveness of my sins? Why do I hope that my life will be cared for by the Father like a bird in the air? Why do I hope that all things are going to work together for my good and that I'm going to have eternal life with God? Why do I hope in this? If I only hope in this life, I'm among all men most to be pitied. Why do I hope in this? And that's a really good question. And I hope that you'll get alone with God and you really will ask this question. It needs to be answered. Why do I hope in these things? Why am I banking everything on this? Why do I live daily in hope in these things? And they become so ingrained into our thinking that sometimes it's profitable just to ask yourself, even some of the young kids, little kids, why do we hope in this? 
Can we give a good answer and a ready answer when someone finally asks this question? And I just want one quick textual observation. As it says, be ready to make a defense for those who ask, what is the hope where? Within you. It's not outside of you. It's not the million arguments on apologetics. And I love apologetics. But that's not what this is talking about. My hope is that dinosaurs really existed. I can prove it. I got Dead Sea Scrolls. I can show you about Noah's Ark. I got the prophecies in the Bible that, you know, there's no way these things could have all come true. That, that's what my hope is. And that is not what they're asking for. All of that can make up uh, the solidifying of our hope. All those things I've mentioned aren't bad. But that's not the answer to the question. And I want this to set you free. Is you don't have to have a master's degree in apologetics before you can share your faith. Do you understand that? If you're a believer for a week or a day, you have a hope. And when someone asks you for that hope, now you go tell them what it is. And it's not going to be all these other things. There's a hope. I've had too many people over the years tell me I don't share my faith because there's just so much I don't have an answer to yet, and I really don't want to make Jesus look bad. I, I don't agree. With, I don't think that's really the reason. I think you don't want to look bad. And I want you to pray over that this isn't saying until you have every answer, don't share your faith. That's a cop-out. That's to right away you can share your hope that you have. And if you don't have a hope, something's really wrong. And so they're asking, your life is different. What's your hope? Hope is more like this. I was a happy unbeliever. And God started breaking me down with some health issues. And my hopes and dreams started being crushed. And I went into kind of a severe depression. And it, it, was, it was a mess for the first time. Everything was going right. And now all of a sudden, it's just a mess. And I started contemplating my mortality, that I'm going to die. And there's a God I'm going to stand before, and I, I need to know whether I'm going to go to heaven or hell, because I was raised in a way I knew there was a heaven and a hell. And I needed to know what's going to happen to Ken Murphy when he dies. And I took up my Bible, and I started reading it every night, sometimes till four in the morning, because I was so afraid of dying and facing God. I was terrified, and I, I couldn't even sleep, so I had to just keep reading this Bible the Gospels, and just help me, help me get to sleep, help me get an answer. Someone gave me a book that said, Evidence Demands a Verdict, and it was amazing. I loved it, but it didn't save me. But after a long, hard journey of struggling, my wife, my brother and his wife, invited me, I told you, to the Billy Graham crusade, and I, I didn't even know who he was. That's how out of the circle I was. I guess when he died, it seemed like everybody knew who he was, but I didn't even know who he was, and they told me. And so I, 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 I went to something that I would have never went to ever in a million years before. And when I walked into Mile High Stadium, uh, it was eerie because it didn't feel like when I walked into the Bronco game. And all of a sudden, there was this weird peace that was, it was weird. <laughs> and this man began preaching about how to have peace with God. And all that I'd been reading in my Bible till four in the morning about Jesus, I read through every gospel like 20 times. And the narrative that God had given of Jesus' life and ministry and his teaching and that it ends with him dying and being resurrected. And as Billy preached, all of a sudden I saw in Christ the answer to all of my problems. And I was born again that night to a living hope, a hope of eternal life and peace with God that now I could die I could stand before God and be forgiven and accepted, and my heart was strangely warmed as I sat there that night uh, in, in July. Jesus Christ became my hope, and I met him there that night for the first time. And what I saw in that gospel took away my heart, and I was wholly his. And I met the one in the narrative of the Bible. I met the one that all the evidence demanded a verdict. And all these things, finally, I could see now the glory and the beauty of Christ. And when I tell an unbeliever that, that I've seen the glory of God in the face of Christ, they're actually fascinated by that answer. 
Because that is what they're asking. What is the hope within you? I had a young man one time, I met with him, and he was a genius, and he was sharing with me all the reasons why uh, there can't be a God. And I said, my problem is I've met him. I, I know him. <laughs> I was there when he put the ring on my finger, called the Holy Spirit. And now he alone is my hope, and he's the Lord of my life, and he's the reason I live the way I do. And he can be yours as well, amen? Amen. And how are we to share that? If you'll look in verse 15, he says, with gentleness and fear. And so now, instead of going around humiliating everybody, putting them in headlocks, making them look stupid, showing why their logic is a joke, and just pounding them, he says, you're now to do this in a spirit of gentleness. There's a meekness in the way that I'm going to share this beauty of Jesus Christ to people. And so a call to do it with gentleness and with fear, and I think it's fear of God. And I think as I share this, I better speak what God says is true in this gospel. It's not what I think or what I hope or what I wish it was. So I'm going to share it with gentleness and with fear to tell them exactly what God says is true. That's my, I'm not worried about the fear of them persecuting me. I'm worried about the fear of not telling God's truth correctly. And you know what this will produce? Go back to verse 13. It will produce a zeal. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? It will make you zealous if you sanctify Christ as Lord, ready to give an account for the hope that's within you. I'll tell you, you'll be zealous for this. And you will be blessed in verse 14. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. You'll be blessed as they persecute you. God will be with you. Your hope, these present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to you. And in 14b, you will not fear their intimidation. You will walk this path of righteousness even if it means suffering and persecution. This path, God will turn it for good and for his glory. That kind of a hope will drive out fear. Christ is sanctified in that. And it will give you a meek hope in gentleness. Because you have found hope in Christ, you know him. So you don't have to be so uptight to fight and argue with those you're sharing. Like, I'm afraid I might lose an argument. I don't have to fear that. Because my hope is in God, not in my arguments, not in my persuasive preaching. God raises the dead. And so I can just share in humility and in trust the truth. God, do your work in their lives and in their hearts. It drives out that that need to be so aggressive because you're really afraid of not being able to answer their questions. Just come and testify humbly and gently of the grace of God and the hope within you. Then in verse 16, keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. They're going to be put to shame as you have a good conscience. Your conscience is not accusing you. You Your conscience is either going to accuse you or excuse you. And if you do evil and and just think all is well, it's going to be coming at you going, man, you you, you did this at work, you cheated, you lied, you've you've been foolish at work, and all these things, your conscience is just going to jump on you. But if you do not, you do not do good, all is not well. And so if you get persecuted, your conscience will make you not feel Guilt, if you did what was right, if you, if you did what God has called you to and you set Christ apart, uh, it, it won't be saying, you're a phony, shut up, be quiet. It's going to say, that's right, this is truth, speak it with a clear conscience and, and don't be afraid. I don't deserve, you know, instead of saying, I deserve what they're doing, I've been a hypocrite, your conscience will mess with you and you will not be faithful in your witness. So if your conscience is clear, I don't have to be anxious when they slander me and when they malign me. And then in verse 17, it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. So there are two options. You can suffer for doing what is right and you'll be blessed and you'll be rewarded with this great hope or you can suffer for what is doing wrong and there'll be a chastening that will come upon you. And I want you to see that God wills both of them. He decrees both. You might have had a season where you kept quiet or you 
you slandered, you slandered your president, you slandered your wife, you know, whatever it is, uh, God has willed that even so to grow you and sanctify you and break you in that. And he's willed that you live righteous and people persecute you and come at you and you get to the point where, man, I can trust God. I can trust God for what he's going to bring into my life as I go shine this light. And, and I, I want to live righteous with a clear conscience and go shine so that they will glorify God in the day of their visitation. Amen? Amen. And our example, no surprise, is Christ. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the suffering. And so I pray that we would walk in that path and that we would walk as we've been learning through this whole section in the footsteps of Jesus and trusting our souls to a faithful creator and doing what is right. And that we'll set Christ apart then as Lord in our hearts and that we have a hope that people are seeing and they're looking and they're asking what is the difference. And we're ready to give an account with gentleness and fear of the difference that God has made in our lives. Amen? If you do not do this, you're not going to suffer well. And you're not going to shine well. And you're always going to be finding a way to hide in Bible studies, to hide in your own family. And you will not go out and do what God's called you to do. And so we need to get this set in our hearts so that we will go be God's shining lights in a dark world that they might proclaim his, his excellencies through our, our, our lives, the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. So let's pray and ask God to do this very thing in our midst. <clears throat> Father, I come before you and I thank you for Peter who uh, is going to give a, an account of the hope within him and he's even going to be led to a cross and be crucified. God, we thank you. I pray the only way we'll ever be able to endure persecution, the only way we could ever walk in the footsteps of Christ is if he is consecrated in our hearts as Lord. And so I pray that there would be no one in here who has not put Christ in his rightful place in their hearts. God, I pray. We don't make Jesus Lord. He is. And I pray that we would consecrate that in every heart. And so, Father, anyone in here who has never come to Christ, they've come to religion Uh, They've come to morality, but they've never come to Jesus Christ, and he does not have that place in their hearts. I pray even this morning, God, that you would save them. You would open their eyes. Let their ears hear for the first time. Give them a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. God, and let them see a Christ who is beautiful, and it's a joy to set him in that place. God, set them free from their bondage and sin, whether it be religion that's tying their hands or whatever's in the way that even this morning Jesus Christ would be put in that place and their hearts that there's nothing higher than Christ. God, do that good work and let us all live into this hope. Let us go live lives that are so different because we have a blessed hope. We have a living hope that will never die because the one who's seated at your right hand. God, let us live different lives. Let us not be worried and anxious and fretting in this world, but let us be children in the palm of our Father's hand. God, do your mighty work within us. We're never going to put you on display by being anxious. God, help us to be settled in this beautiful truth and that you'll use it in a mighty way to to have those glorify you, that these glorify you in the day of the visitation because of all this excellent behavior among the saints in this body. God, I thank you for them. Let their lights so shine before men in such a way that they will see their good deeds and glorify their Father who's in heaven. God, thank you for this. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.